why does old Jones insist that anyone who sees the phantom hearse stop outside their place of an evening will die within the week? Merry Fortune, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you to all of our financial supporters. We couldn't do this without you. We really try to make your support worth your while. You get so much out of this. For a $5 monthly donation, you get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook download. Give more and you get more. It helps us have something solid to count on every month. You can build out your classic audiobook library and... You help give folks like you the chance to discover the classics in a curated and easily accessible format. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com today and become a financial supporter. You'll be glad you did. Thank you so much. If it's more convenient, we are streaming our episodes through YouTube now. A link can be found in the description of today's episode. I've got a few more titles I'm working on for the archives. Check out our new products category to see the new stuff we've got coming out. Today's story is written by one of the pioneers of detective fiction, but likely you've never heard of her. Mary Helena Fortune. She traveled from Canada to Australia in 1855, where, for the next 50 years, she contributed to magazines and newspapers under the pseudonyms Waif Wanderer, WW, and her own initials, MHF. She wrote in a variety of genres, poetry, serialized novels, memoirs, and even gothic romance. But most significantly, she wrote over 500 detective stories. Her collection of stories, The Detectives Album, by W.W., was published in 1871 and was described as the first book of detective stories to appear in Australia. Only one copy is known to remain in existence. Mary Fortune helped delineate a few of the techniques significant in detective fiction. For example, the forensic manner in which the crime is treated and delivering the story from the point of view of the detective Today's story also includes a supernatural element, which is also innovative and synchronous with some Russian crime fiction, which we've discussed previously. And now, The Phantom Hearse by Mary Fortune. Many of my readers will have observed that many corner shops, whatever their location, are known by the names of their owners. The one I am going to introduce you to was literally a corner shop, and the individuality of the man who kept it had obscured the very name of the street. He never heard his shop called the corner shop. It was Jones's, or Old Jones's, and the corner at which it stood was, and is, Jones's Corner. I introduced Jones and his place of business to you, on one sunny afternoon in March, when Lumsden, the new Bobby, was airing his dignity in taking a survey of this particular part of a beat that was quite new to him. Indeed, all beats were new to the young man, who had only just been called in, though his name had been on the list of applicants for police employment for a good while. Lumsden was an especially raw recruit and as full of an idea of his own importance as raw police recruits generally are. He was standing on the pavement, engaged in a condescending conversation with a sharp-looking resident named Jack Turner, a man of forty, perhaps, and of a small, wiry build. Turner had been relating to Lumsden a legend of the neighborhood, about which the policeman was disposed to air his superior knowledge. And do you mean to tell me, now, that there are live people hereabouts so ignorant as to believe that kind of a yarn? He asked, with a smile that puffed his fat cheeks out till they met the collar of his jumper. Plenty of them. 
Why, a man can't help believe in what he sees with his own eyes. And have you seen it? Yes, I have, and many mourn me. But if you want to hear all about it, just ask old Jones. He knows the story from the beginning. Perhaps Lumsden would not have condescended to exhibit his curiosity to old Jones or anyone else if he had not been provided with a convenient excuse. He was standing in front of Turner's door, and the corner shop was obliquely opposite when a man came to the door of old Jones's shop and, with his face turned back, indulged in some pretty strong language that was apparently addressed to old Jones himself. Who is that? asked Lumsden of his new acquaintance. It's a chap that lives down the lane behind here. Jerry Swipes, they calls him. Him and old Jones are always having rows. What about? Goodness knows. Jerry is in the old man's debt, I fancy, and it's hard to get any money out of Swipes. Jerry Swipes? Is that the man's real name? Blast if I can tell you, but it may be a nickname, for he is a regular Swipe and no mistake. While Lumsden had been gaining this information, Jerry, a tall, slouching figure with a sandy face and a long, sharp nose, had been roaring his uncomplimentary remarks to old Jones, who now came to the door of his shop with a red and angry face, as Swipes edged up the street toward the lane. Don't let me catch you inside my shop again, shouted the old man as he shook his fist after Jerry. As soon as I do... I'll give you in charge. You're nothing but a sneaking thief, that's what you are. I'll ram them words down your old throat one of these days, shrieked Jerry as he reached the end of the lane. Police, is it, by gar? It'll be police with yourself first. You'll give me a glass of whiskey next time I call, eh, old man? And the dirty, unkempt-looking mortal disappeared into the mouth of the unsavory right-of-way. Old Jones's vituperation stopped as suddenly as Jerry disappeared, and such a look of fear came into the twinkling eyes under his penthouse, ragged eyebrows that even Lumsden observed it, and Turner had to turn away his face to hide the grin of enjoyment that overspread his parchment-tried visage. But he controlled himself to remark ere he entered his door, Now is your time to go and ask old Jones about the phantom funeral and you will be sure to hear all about this quarrel with Jerry. Lumsden took the hint, and marching across the narrow street, was at Jones's almost as soon as the old man had got behind his counter again. Jones had all the characteristics of a thriving corner shop, with a little extra dirt and untidiness into the bargain. It was so small that the counter on two sides left but little space for the use of customers that small space behind further curtailed by stock, in the form of boxes of soap, bags of potatoes, rice, oatmeal, and sugar. The narrow shelves were laden with fly-marked packages, and boxes and bottles of great variety, and the space that ought to be empty under the ceiling was hung with brooms, brushes, clotheslines, and tinware, the original brightness of which was dimmed by age and smoke. Into this confined emporium, Constable Lumsden stepped, meeting old Jones' suspicious eyes as that worthy very unceremoniously resumed his usual seat behind the counter, placed his spectacles astride his nose, and, with a sharp rustle, shook out the morning paper on his knee. "'Good day to you,' said the young policeman, as he looked curiously around him. "'Good day it is. What can I serve you with?' "'Serve?' Oh, nothing. I heard some strong language at your door just now, and came in to see what it was all about. Old Jones gave his paper an angry rustle as he answered. Have you come in here to know what's the matter every time I get cheek from a customer? You'll not be able to do much in the other parts of your beat. The cheek wasn't all on the customer's side this time. I heard you calling the man a thief, and in the open street. That's something in my line, you'll allow. And so he is a thief, cried old Jones angrily. He's the biggest loafer in Melbourne. He only comes near the shop when he wants to shake a plug of tobacco 
or a pipe. What did he shake today? When I want to lay a charge against him, I'll take it to the sergeant, said old Jones, expecting that it would shut up the officious young trap. But it had very little effect on Constable Lumsden, who was, fortunately for himself, not very thin-skinned. Ah, two might play at visiting the sergeant. If Jerry Swipes went up himself, he has a very good charge against you and me for a witness. It's against the laws to call a man a thief in the open street. I can prove it. If you could prove it twice over, all the same. The law won't allow you to do it, and I'd advise you to give him that glass of whiskey he seems to expect from you the next time you get the chance. At this second allusion to the whiskey, old Jones once more grew white under Lumsden's observing eyes, and his knobby, hard hands shook so that they rustled the paper he held. Seeing this repeated agitation at the allusion to spirits, Lumsden took it into his head that drink was sold on the sly at Jones's, and he determined to keep a close watch on the place in future. The old man made no immediate reply to Lumsden's advice about the treatment of his enemy, Jerry. He was considering within himself that it would perhaps be better for his own interests that he should take a different tone with the new policeman. The independent sharpness of Lumsden was a new experience at the corner, the last man on the beat having been an old, steady-going policeman who duly considered Mr. Jones's status in the neighborhood, and was friendly accordingly. Old Jones would have liked to twist the impertinent young constable's neck, but he tried to do the amiable instead, a very difficult matter for the crusty old man. And the fact is, my temper's wore out with them sort of customers, he said with a sigh at his amiability. It's a very low neighborhood, especially down Long's Lane, and it's getting lower every day. They get a few things from you, then they get into your book somehow, in spite of you, and they wind up with dropping into steel when they think your back's turned. A bad business, returned Lumsden, but without the least intonation of sympathy. And what does that fellow you were jawing to do for a living? Jerry Swipes? Ah, he'd be a puzzle to tell you. He hires a truck and pretends to attend to the markets and that. I've heard of him rag and bottle gathering, but it's all a blind. You've been a long time in the neighborhood, I suppose? Asked Lumsden. As failing anything else in view, he took a pinch out of the oatmeal bag and began to munch it. I've been nigh on thirty year in this house and this shop, and if anyone knows the neighborhood, I ought to. Yes, I suppose so, was the slow and evidently absent reply. And that reminds me, I've been told some ridiculous yarn about the ghost of a hearse that appears around here. Can you tell me anything about it? There's nothing ridiculous about it, young man. It's only too true that the phantom funeral, as people have got to call it, is often seen in S and O Street. I've seen it often, and I know how it began. There isn't a man in C can tell you as much as I can about it, Old Jones's air had quite undergone a change when his favorite topic came to be dwelt on. The paper was cast aside, and he rose from the old armchair. He took off his old greasy felt hat and ran his fingers through his stubbly gray hair until it stood nearly straight up. And then he replaced the hat and ahemmed <clears throat> as he looked inquiringly towards Lumsden. I'd like to hear the story, said the latter as he looked out of the door to see there was no duty staring him in the face, and then leaned easily against the heap of bags as he listened to old Jones. It's getting on for twelve years ago now since that hearse was first seen, and people always said it was because Sam Brown was carried out of number nine in the dead of night and taken to the morgue without common decency in a dray. Yeah, Sam was murdered or committed suicide. It was never actually decided which. And from that day to this, the hearse haunts the place as a sort of as a sort of revenge on the neighbors that they didn't pay more respect to his remains. 
But that's trash, said Lumsden. How could a dead man set a hearse to haunt a neighborhood? I don't believe a word of it. I've heard many say that. As grew white to hear the hearse mentioned within less than a year after, returned old Jones solemnly. It's the scoffers who see it, and it's not lucky to see it. Not lucky? No. If a man sees it, as you may when you're on night duty, the best thing he can do is to turn his back and walk away from it. There has never been a man foolhardy enough to watch it, but he died within the year. But you've seen it, you say. Aye, by chance. One night a woman was very bad down Long's Lane there, and she wasn't expected to live over the night. I got quite nervous-like and couldn't sleep. It was a bright moonlight, and about two o'clock in the morning I saw a slow shadow cross the blind of my window there. Before I had time to think, I was out on the floor and had the curtain in my hand, for I thought it was the phantom hearse. It was. I saw it for a moment moving slowly past, and I dropped the blind quick and got into bed again. What was it like? asked Lumsden. Like a plain, low box hearse, all black and with one black horse in it. Sometimes there is a driver, and sometimes a man in black walks at the horse's head. It makes no sound, and is like a dream. By George, I'd make a nightmare of it, cried the young trap. Do you mean to tell me that no man has ever had the courage to walk up to the thing and grip it? No man has ever been foolhardy enough to go straight to his deathbed that way, was the serious answer. But the unbelieving policeman laughed aloud as he raised himself and went toward the door, saying lightly, Well, here's one man that'll take the first chance of feeling what that ghostly machine is made of, at all events. Good gracious. Do you think people believe such yarns as that? As soon as Lumsden had left the shop, Jones's face fell, and he muttered uneasily to himself as he stood by the counter with his hands upon it and an anxious look in his scowling face. He was not at any time a pleasant picture, that old Jones of the corner shop, but he looked absolutely repellent as he stood muttering to himself, with his ragged eyebrows almost met in an anxious scowl. A few minutes later, the old man, dashing the old greasy hat under the counter, began to divest himself of his rag of a coat, leaving the shop by the back as he did so. He went through a very slovenly kitchen and to the veranda at the back of it, where an old, meanly attired woman was washing in a wooden tub that seemed almost as old as herself. She looked up with a frightened air as Jones shouted at her, Marjorie! Yes, master. Leave that washing and get on a clean apron. I'm going out. You'll have to mind the shop. Yes, master. And the thin, trembling arms were being hastily wiped in her wet apron as she was hurrying away. Stop! I want to speak to you. She stopped instantly, and humbly turned an apparently vacant face towards him. You've got to watch that boy. That's your business, you know. Don't you go trying to serve or you'll poison someone, but keep your eyes sharp on Con, you hear? It would be queer if she didn't hear, for the man was roaring at the top of his voice, and at every emphasized word the poor old creature jumped. I hear. I'll watch him well. I'll leave nothing in the till, and mind, see that there's something in it when I come back. Give no credit, do you hear? Yes, master, I'll let nothing go without the money. And count it before you let the things go out of your hands. Yes, master. While Jones had been giving these instructions, he had been making a pretense of a wash in the old woman's tub from pure suds, and when he dismissed her with a nod, he seized a grimy old towel and rubbed his face with it. It seemed as if Jones was in an awful hurry, for he had not finished with the towel when he had crossed the littered yard and was giving some more orders to a sharp-looking boy of about thirteen who had been occupied in washing bottles in a dilapidated shed. Con! Yes, sir. 
I'm going out for an hour or so, and the old woman is to mind the shop. You keep your eye on her. Yes, sir. Let her sit in a chair and count the money. Do you serve, and mind, don't give one penny of credit. Very well, sir. And watch the old woman well. See that she doesn't get slipping a penny now and then into some corner of her gown. I've known her to do it afore. I'll watch her close, sir. That's right. And see you keep account of every penny's worth you let go. I'll be very careful, sir. Ten minutes afterwards, old Jones was scuttling away down the street pretty easy in his mind, because he had put in practice his favorite receipt for keeping people honest. Set one to watch the other, he would say. That's the way to do it. You don't want no detectives if you set one to watch the other. Very few would have recognized the two happy faces that beamed behind old Jones's counter that afternoon to be those of the stupid, hopeless-looking old woman who was previously slopping grimy rags at the back and the half-discontented one of the boy who had listened with such outward respect to a master he both disliked and despised. The old woman, who was no other than old Joan's lawful wife, sat in Joan's chair stiffly and upright, with her hands folded on a clean white apron and a broad-bordered, starched muslin cap on her unsteady head. Her withered old face was beaming with pride and delight, and with an air of dignity that was pitiful when one knew its short-lived nature. The one happiness of poor old Mrs. Jones was in being permitted to play at keeping shop, for it was only play after all, Con doing in reality whatever was necessary in the small sales. Con was very busy just now, wiping down the counter, and tidying up things a bit, as he was wont to call it when speaking to Mrs. Jones. Isn't this fine? cried the gratified old creature, with a child's unreasoning delight. If the master would go away oftener, and let us keep shop, Con, wouldn't it be nice? It would, answered the boy with some decision. But no such luck. Some old men die but the likes of him never dies. I wish he would die, Mrs. Jones said in a deep whisper to the lad. I'm always a-wishing it. If he did, there would be no one to knock me about, and I would sit in the shop always. I wish that dead hearse would stop right under his window some night. I do. Did you ever see the dead hearse, Mrs. Jones? questioned the boy as he ceased his rubbing at the counter and looked at the old woman curiously. I did, she replied with an energetic nod that set her wide cap frills bobbing. I seen it one night last March. The master, he woke me up to see it. It was passing the window and stopped opposite Grinder's. Mrs. Grinder, she died next day but one. That's the reason I wouldn't never sleep in that front room again. And besides, the master, he was always knocking me about for snoring. I don't snore, he does. Aye, Jones wanted to get you out of his room, missus, and he wasn't short of an excuse. I know. This unexpected remark was made by no other than Jerry Swipes, whose lanky figure had entered the shop unobserved in the deep interest attached to the dead hearse, as poor old Mrs. Jones called it. Con stared at the man, but Mrs. Jones was on her dignity, and bridling, asked what business it was of Jerry Swipes. None, missus, none whatsoever. Only no man as is a man likes to see a lawful wife made a slave of and beat when another woman. But it's none of my business. Con, hand me a threepenny plug and a pint. You don't know what you're talking of, Jerry Swipes, cried Mrs. Jones with angry suspicion. It was my own doing as made me go to sleep in the back room. Was it? Well, then, maybe you knows what Jones does of a night since you left. 
If he doesn't, just watch him, and you'll see. That's all. Listening open-mouthed to these strange words of the disreputable customer, Khan had mechanically laid the required articles on the counter. In an instant, the tobacco and pipe were transferred to Jerry's pocket and his ragged ulster wrapped over them. Put em down, me boy, he said with a leer as he made for the door. Me credit's always good with Mr. Jones. Yes, missus, that's what I say. Watch him and you'll know. Oh, Mrs. Jones, he's never paid for him, cried Con. The master will kill us. Watch him and you'll know, murmured the old woman, on whom Jerry's words appeared to have made a strange impression. She was staring at the door out of which Jerry had just passed, with her brows bent together, and a queer, thoughtful look in her faded eyes that puzzled the boy. Please, Mrs. Jones, reiterated Con. That swipes took the pipe and backy without paying for it. What'll we do? The master will kill us. Watch him, and you'll know. Again murmured the completely absorbed old woman. And it's true. He used to go somewheres at night. I've missed him. Fortunately for Con's peace of mind at this moment, there entered two legitimate customers who put a few shillings in the till and distracted Mrs. Jones' thoughts again. It was painful, even to the boy, to see her pluming herself in the chair and feeling so proud and happy, when it was so certain that at the first sound of her master's harsh voice she would drop into the cringing, half-stupid slave, who seemed to have no idea beyond the avoidance, by unselfish service, of the kicks and thumps the brute was in the habit of bestowing on her whenever he wanted some object to explode his temper on. By this time, Constable Lumsden had worked round his beat and was in the vicinity of Jones's corner again. As he was about to pass the door, he looked in, and seeing only the boy and the half-idiotic face of an old woman behind the counter, he changed his mind and entered. Mrs. Jones bridled immediately. The poor old creature had a very exaggerated idea of a policeman's importance, and, being a woman, was not perhaps insensible to the young chap's ruddy and healthy-looking face. Con was not so sure of Lumsden. He had a town boy's detestation of all bobbies, big and little, young and old, and would just as soon have seen a big brown snake wandering into the shop as that young man in blue. Is Jones at home? asked Lumsden. No, sir, he's gone out on business. This is Mrs. Jones. Yes. She nodded proudly as she smoothed down the white apron with both trembling hands. I'm keeping shop. I'd like to keep shop every day. Would you? Lumsden asked, with a suspicious look into the childish-looking face for the constable was not quite sure whether she was laughing at him or was in reality half-witted. But he was soon at his ease, for it was impossible to doubt the want of intellect so plainly pictured in the vacant, withered features. I suppose now you sell everything here? Yes, she answered proudly. Everything. I was just wishing for a glass of something, Lumsden said in a low tone, as he glanced towards the quiet street. There's no one about. I'll take a glass of spirits, please. And he quietly laid a shilling on the counter. Oh, we don't keep no drink here, sir, quickly returned Con, as he pushed back the shilling, for which the unconscious old woman's hand was already outstretched. I wasn't talking to you, snapped the constable. Are you Jones's son? No, sir, I'm only hired, but I've been with them a good while. You're too precious sharp, Lumsden said, with a frown that he believed sufficient to overcome the sharpest youngster in the city. Mrs., can't you sell me a glass of something? The master takes a glass often, she mumbled, but he never gives me none. I don't know where he keeps his bottle. I expect it's in the front room. 
Master always locks a front room when he goes out. Huh. Give me sixpenworth of lollies, boy. And the discontented constable pushed back the shilling, on which the old woman's eyes were fixed greedily. Con weighed the lollies, and was graciously presented with some of them for his own use. Did you ever see this ghost of a hearse that haunts this neighborhood? asked Lumsden of the lad, as he decided that the old woman was not worth talking to. No, sir, I never did. But Mrs. Jones has seen it, haven't you, Mrs. Jones? Seen the dead hearse? I should think so. <laughs> There's always someone dies when that comes. I wish it would stop right there tonight. And she pointed a shaky finger straight out of the shop door to the empty street, on which the afternoon sun was shining warmly. And then as if the subject brought back to her memory Jerry Swipes's words, she repeated them to herself with her brows again tangled into a thoughtful frown. Just you watch him, and you'll see. What is she muttering? Oh, nothing of any consequence, sir. She's talking to herself half the time. Huh. A little queer, eh? A little, sir. Did you never see the old chap sell a glass now? Asked the clever new policeman, and Con's naturally rosy face grew crimson. If there is one thing more despised than another by even the lowest Melbourne lad, it is an informer. In this case, Con had nothing to tell, but it insulted him that it should be supposed possible that he would tell, even if he knew anything. Lumsden saw the boy's increase of color, and it increased his suspicions. No, Con answered, without the sir this time, you'll observe nor I never seen no spirits of any kind about, even for Mr. Jones's own drinking. If he keeps any, as it must be, as Mrs. Jones says, in his own room, that's mostly always locked. The mention of her name aroused the old woman from an unusual absorption in thought, and she repeated over and over again, Yes, Con, in his own room, always in his own room. In a very discontented mood, Lumsden strolled out to the pavement again, munching his lollies as he went. And it so happened that Jerry Swipes at that moment appeared at the corner of the lane, and after a sharp look up and down the empty street, beckoned to the policeman. Lumsden was inclined to stand on his dignity and let the drunken-looking fellow come over to him if he wanted him. But all at once he remembered that this was the man old Jones had been abusing, and thinking of the probability of retaliation, he put his dignity in his pocket with the lollies and crossed the narrow street. Just come down here a few steps, constable. I want to speak to you. Lumsden followed the speaker a few yards and then stopped. The lane was most uninviting to all senses, and two or three red-faced, loud-voiced women were in front of some old wooden cottages farther down gossiping amid the noise of screaming babies and quarreling children. If you have anything private to say, there's no need of going any farther. There's nothing but a dead wall here. It's the fence of Turner's Woodyard, returned Jerry, and I guess you're right. We can speak low, and besides, there's no one in the yard. I saw Turner go out five minutes ago. Well, what is your business? Are you game now to go halves in an informing business? Asked Jerry, cunningly, in reply to this question. Informing? Is it about old Jones? Was the sharp return. The very man. By Jove, I suspected it, cried Lumsden, as he stooped and slapped his leg in thorough enjoyment. Game? I should think so. And then a sharp suspicion crossed his mind and made Lumsden look steadily into the bloated face with the sharp nose. If you are on the lookout for a reward, how is it you don't try to keep it all to yourself? He asked. Do you think I'd ever get it if I hadn't someone decent to me up? Jerry asked cunningly. I couldn't take him in single-handed. I'd want help. And if I was the respectablest in Melbourne, there wouldn't be a conviction without the worm. 
Without the worm? What do you mean? What are you talking about? I'm talking about a still. Didn't you know it a four? The low whistle that gave expression to Lumsden's surprise so prolonged that Jerry cut it short with a hush. I thought it was sly grog selling, he exclaimed. I noticed the effect your mention of the glass of whiskey had on Jones a while ago. And I thought it was sly grog selling, but a still. By Jove, are you sure, man? As sure as that there fence is made of wood, was the answer, as Swipes put his hand on Turner's fence. And now just wait a minute till I see if Turner's back. He stepped on a stone as he was speaking and craned his neck in an examination of the woodyard. No, he's not at home yet, for the back door's shut and the barrow's not there. Come now, let us settle about it. It must be done tonight, for I gave him a good many hints today, and he may be frightened. He's gone out, said Lumsden. Yes, and I am afraid he's gone to try and get rid of the plant somehow, for he must have customers for the spirit somewhere and they're bound to help him. The best thing that you can do is to go up to the sergeant at once and lay our claim to reward. There was a little more talk about it, and when it was over, they separated, so as to avoid suspicion, appointing, however, a time when they were to meet at the police office in the presence of the sergeant. Old Jones came home very shortly after, in one of his humors. At the first glimpse of his face in the doorway, all brightness fell from that of the poor old wife, who hobbled to the back, leaving Con to face the master. And Con did with more confidence than usual, for there was some money in the till, and he had some news to tell Jones that might make him think less of Jerry having outwitted him in the matter of the pipe and tobacco. Well... Everything's at sixes and sevens, I suppose? Jones asked with a furious look around the shop. The man wanted something to swear at, for his blood was boiling within him. No, sir, everything's all right in the shop, only, the boy hastened to add, ere Jones had time to explode, that young Bobby's been here, sir. Again? What the deuce did he want? I'm afraid he was after no good, master, replied Con as he shook his head sagely. He tried to get a glass of spirits out of the mistress and me. Actually put the money on the counter for it. What? Yes, indeed, sir. He gammoned that he knew drink was sold here, but when he could get nothing out of us, he bought a sixpenworth of lollies and went away. Jones absolutely turned gray with apprehension as he stared at the boy. You are sure you didn't tell the villain anything? I had nothing to tell him, sir. That's true, Con. Of course, you had nothing to tell him. You may go out and finish them bottles now. Jones fell into his old armchair behind the counter, dumbfounded. He felt that he was caught in a trap and didn't know where to seek help. He had taken off his best hat and held the old one in his hands looking at it in a queer, bewildered way. When a man entered with an active step, it was Turner, the small, sharp, dark man that kept the woodyard. How many hundred of wood will I bring you over, Jones? He asked as he bent toward the old man with a strange grin on his face. Not one! shouted old Jones as the blood rushed into his face and his eyes flashed under their overhanging brows. He had got someone to vent his rage on at last. Not one! I'll never take another from you, you swindling rascal. The last was green mess, mate. Hush, hush, Jones. You have no idea what a mess you're in. I've come to give you a bit of neighborly help. For both Jerry Swipes and the new Bobby will be down on you in a brace of shakes. Jerry Swipes? The new Bobby? Oh, curse them but even as the words fell from his lips, they trembled, and he put on his old hat in a hopeless way, very unusual with him. Yes, and there's no time to waste. Jerry has been watching you by nights, it seems, and he's found out all about the still. He's told Lumsden, and they've gone to the sergeant and agreeing to share the reward for informing between them. Oh, Lord, what'll I do? 
groaned the old man. That's what I'm come to tell you. I have the horse ready in the cart and the wood in it. I'm going to bring it into the yard, and you'll pack all your whiskey into it, as well as the whole still if we can manage it, and I'll drive him off before the informers come. Where will you take him? Jones asked doubtfully. Where they'll be safe? Never you mind, so long as they don't get him here. But what are you doing it for? I never was friends with you, Jack Turner. What are you so willing to do this for? No, you old screw. You never was friends with me. I don't owe you so much as a thank you for one neighborly act. What am I doing of it for? What a darn fool you are to ask. I'm a-doing it for what I can make out of it, of course. You think I'm a fool to do it for nothing? I'll save you a fifty-pound fine and the loss of your stock, never fear. But I'll ask for my pay when the job's done. Strange to say, this assertion, though it touched the weakest part of old Jones, the region of his pocket, convinced him of Turner's sincerity. And before many minutes had elapsed, the woodman's cart was in the old storekeeper's yard. Jones sent Con and Mrs. Jones into the shop, while a new load was packed into the bottom of the conveyance and covered with a layer of wood that made all, as Turner declared, look quite natural. Few could have guessed in what a state of excitement old Jones had lately been, had they looked into the shop after Turner's departure and seen him, spectacles on nose, apparently absorbed in the paper. At least, Jerry Swipes didn't guess it, when he entered with a wicked grin on his dirty visage, and with Constable Lumsden at his heels. I hope I don't intrude, Mr. Jones, sneered Jerry, who had evidently managed an extra glass somewhere. Allow me to introduce my friend, Constable Lumsden. Stash that, cried Lumsden angrily, as he pushed Jerry out of his way very unceremoniously and advanced to the counter. I'm here on duty, Jones. We have received information that you are carrying on a sort of private distillery here in contravention to the laws, and we're here to search the premises. Search and be hanged to you was the very unexpected reply. But by the heavens above me, if that drunken thief comes inside my private premises, I'll brain him, so help me. Will you? retorted the pot-valiant swipes. Maybe two could play at that game. Though, if it comes to brains, it's very little you'd have to let out. Stand back, Lumsden, and let me blacken that old villain's eyes. If you don't keep quiet, Swipes, I'll put you out myself, was all the comfort the angry man got from his unwilling companion, who went on to Jones. You may as well let us in peacefully, Jones. There's two constables in the backyard by this time, and there's no earthly use offering any resistance. I'm offering no resistance. Didn't I tell you to search? There's the door open, but I say again, if that informer crosses that threshold, I'll fell him. Oh, I'm an informer, eh? Do you hear that, Lumsden? By George, the old fool is giving himself away. It seems there's something to inform on, eh? Hold your jaw, Swipes. You'd better go round to the back. There's no use having any unnecessary row. And the young policeman went behind the counter to the door that old Jones was still holding open with shaking hands. Jerry, finding himself in a minority did as Lumsden had suggested, and went round to the yard, cursing Jones all the way. Jones immediately shut the shop door and barred it behind him, going out then after the young policeman to see what disturbance they would make among his household goods. That part of the household goods represented by poor Mrs. Jones was in such a state of bewildered surprise at the advent of two strange men in blue entering her slovenly kitchen that the entrance of another from the shopway added nothing to her confusion. Lumsden, as befitting the fact that he was co-informer, took the lead in what followed, his first action being to proceed toward Joan's own bedroom and order it to be opened. My information is that the door of a cellar opens in a closet of this room, he said importantly, and that in that cellar is the still. 
Without a word, Jones unlocked the door and flung it open. At this moment, Jerry Swipes, fortified by the presence of so many policemen, advanced to push his way into Jones's room, and without another word of warning, the old man who had been a pugilist in his young days lifted his fist and struck Swipes so heavily between the eyes that the half-drunk man fell to the floor almost as if he had been shot. "'I had a right to do it!' cried Jones. "'I warned him! I put no hindrance in the way of the police, but that man I'll not let cross my threshold! Clear out of this, or I'll let you have it double!' Jerry, who was picking himself up with difficulty, turned to go. But as he did, he uttered a threat that was remembered against him afterwards. "'Do you see them?' he asked, pointing to the drops of blood on the floor. "'You drew them from my face, but by heaven I'll let every drop out of your heart for him." And he staggered blindly out into the yard. It is unnecessary to enter into particulars of the unsuccessful search made by the constables of Jones's cellar and premises generally. There was nothing whatever incriminating discovered. The unsuspected load Turner had taken had removed everything immediately connected with the still, save some empty hot pockets and sugar bags and a suspiciously smelling keg. Jones enjoyed the discomfiture of Lumsden, as indeed did his fellow constables, who were like all the world jealous of a neighbor's good fortune. I'm sorry for your disappointment, gentlemen, said Jones with a derisive grin. But you see, it is not always well to depend on information received from a low scoundrel. Howsomever, I'm sorry to see Mr. Lumsden look so down in the mouth. I don't mind giving him a glass of very good whiskey I happen to have here by me. Hang you and your whiskey, too was the young man's not over-civil reply to this kind offer. And in a few moments, the police accompanied by the terribly disappointed Jerry had all cleared out by the back way. To say that Jerry was disappointed is putting it very weakly. He evinced his feelings in such threats at Jones and indeed at the police, who had, he fancied, cheated him in some way or another, that Lumsden was within an ace of marching him off to the lockup. Lumsden was quite as much disappointed as the informer, though he was able to control his feelings a little better. So convinced was he that Jones had been warned and cleared his cellar out that he determined on doing duty on his own account that night. That is, instead of going to bed or to amuse himself after his patrol was over, after dinner he returned to his beat to watch Jones's corner. He did not get to his beat till about eleven o'clock, believing that whatever illegal thing might be done on the old man's premises would not be attempted before that hour. He had acquainted the constable on duty of his intention so that his movements should be taken no notice of, and he chose as his place of watch the entrance to a narrow right-of-way opposite old Jones's backyard. When he took up his post, there was a light in the shop, though it was shut but all was darkness at the back. Jones was not the man to let his wife and Con sit up burning candles for nothing. After about half an hour's watch, Lumsden saw the light from the shop disappear, and in a few minutes a man crossed the yard stealthily, opened Jones's gate noiselessly, and slipped round the corner of the street where the door of the shop was. Lumsden was curious and followed him to the corner. There he saw a small, lithe figure dart across the moonlit street and enter Turner's woodyard. Lumsden went back to his station, wondering what Turner was doing there at that time of night, and just then the town clock was just striking twelve. It was quite another hour before he saw anything else at Jones's, then a slinking figure crept along in the shadow of the houses, and deftly climbing Joan's high fence, dropped inside. The young constable recognized Jerry Swipes instantly. 
and guessing at once that the low scoundrel was on the same self-imposed duty as himself, that is, watching old Jones, with the hope of making some discovery of a fresh plant. It was about half an hour before Jerry left the yard, and it was chiming the half hour after one as he dropped out into the street again and ran down the lane. Another half hour, and Lumsden saw a light appear for a moment in the kitchen window. The light was very indistinct, for the window was under the back veranda, where Mrs. Jones did her poor washing, but it was distinct enough for Mr. Lumsden to see it twice, once when it seemed to come and go away again, and once more when it reappeared and seemed to be suddenly put out. Believing that Jones was rambling about the place, making a bestowal of some illegal machinery, Lumsden was about to climb the fence for a nearer watch when he saw something that changed his mind with a strange suddenness. The young man had heard no noise, but he felt, as it were, that there was something moving in his vicinity. Turning involuntarily, he saw, coming down the street full in the moonlight, what seemed to be the shadow of a hearse. A sort of fear crept upon him for a moment, but he recovered himself speedily, remembering his jibes at the dead hearse that very day and his determination to prove its mortal and tangible nature. The thing passed him, the shadow of a hearse, and turned Jones's corner noiselessly. It appeared to Lumsden's eyes just as Jones had described it, a plain box-like hearse with a cover shaped like a sarcophagus. The shape of a black horse drew it, and the shape of a man in black, with long black crepe weepers hanging down from his hat, sat in front and held the shadowy reins. There is not one among the very wisest of us without some hidden superstition, however we may try to deceive ourselves about the fact. And young Lumsden felt a queer, cold creeping up his back in spite of his declared unbelief in the phantom hearse. No sooner had it turned the corner and was out of sight, however, but he pulled himself together and hurried after it, determined to see the affair through. He had not far to go. I have said the thing turned the corner. It had barely done so. When Lumsden reached the front of the shop, he saw the hearse standing in front of the window he knew belonged to Jones's bedroom, the vehicle and horse still and soundless, the man sitting on his box as if carved out of black marble. One moment the young man hesitated, for he was only mortal, but then he strode on toward the hearse, his steps making a loud noise on the moonlit pavement. His heart was beating quickly, but he did not stop until he was so near that by putting out his hand he should have been able to touch the hearse. He put it out and touched nothing. He moved a little nearer and tried again. Still, there was nothing tangible. But he heard a terrible moan that seemed to come from the interior of the ghostly vehicle and started back. When he looked again, the whole thing had disappeared. There was nothing in the whole length of the street but the moonlight lying upon pavement and roadway. Constable Lumsden stared for some minutes, and then being, as I have already said, only mortal, he turned quickly and sought the companionship of his fellow policeman, whose step he fortunately heard at that moment echoing down a neighboring cross street. The constable on the beat that night was an elderly man, and he did not laugh at Lumsden's story. I've heard of it often, he said thoughtfully, but I never saw it, and I don't want to. They say it is a sure sign of death in the house where it stops. It was at Jones's, you say? Yes, but was it there after all? I wonder if I could fancy it all. You ought to be the best judge of that yourself. But that the hearse has been seen... There's no manner of doubt. I've been on this beat over eight years. I've heard of the hearse a dozen times and more. 
Well, whether or not I imagined the hearse, I'm certain the sound was real. What sound? Well, the awful groan I heard. It made my blood creep. You'd better go and get a sleep, said Cooney, or you'll not be fit for duty tomorrow. And the young man took his advice, the sight of the phantom hearse having cured him of all the interest he had lately felt in still hunting. Lumsden lodged with Cooney, who was a married man with a family, and it seemed to the young man that he had not been asleep ten minutes when he was wakened by a rough shake. Cooney was standing by the side of his bed with something in his rugged face that roused Lumsden at once. What is it? he asked. It's murder, that's what it is. Get up at once, and be putting on your clothes while I tell you. You'll get no chance of pocketing that fifty pounds now. Old Jones was found dead in his bed this morning. Good heavens! Who found him? That little chap Con who lives there. It seems he had to call Jones every morning before he opened the shop at seven o'clock. And this morning, when he went, he found the old man so sound asleep that nothing but the last trump will waken him. The boy ran to tell me, and before Smith relieved me, the neighborhood was in a commotion. What time is it now? Near nine. Hurry out and get your breakfast. Didn't you tell me you saw Jerry Swipes climbing over Jones' fence last night? Yes and then a sudden recollection of the terrible threat Jerry had made against the old man after he was struck down recurred to Lumsden. How was he murdered? Stabbed in the breast, or rather stomach, by some sharp instrument. He appears to have been lying on his back, asleep, from what the doctor says, and was found in a pool of his own blood. By Jove, Jerry seems to have kept his word. He swore he would let every drop out of the old man's heart and it looks as if he'd done it. You think it was Jerry? Can there be a doubt of it after what you saw? At all events, I went straight to his tumble-down shanty and arrested him on suspicion. How did he take it? Like a man stupid, as indeed he was with the effects of yesterday's drink. There was blood on his clothes, too, but he denies the murder, of course. Does he deny he was in Jones's yard this morning? No, he owns to it. He says he went in hopes of finding the old man in the cellar. It seems there's some crack in the wall he can see through. Come now, if you've done breakfast, we'll be down and see what we can find out. You can question the boy this time. We can understand the deep interest of Lumsden in this case. It was his first in the force, and the matter of the suspected illicit work in Jones's place, together with his own intimate connection with it as co-informer, made the whole affair of importance to him. And there was what he had seen last night, too, that solemn hearse that had stood for a few moments at the dead man's house. He could never again disbelieve in apparitions as long as he lived. Talking the case over, the two men walked quickly to Jones's corner. The shop was shut, except that one shutter had been taken off to light it, and there in pitiful state, sat Mrs. Jones, with her one decent dress, a black stuff, on, and a white apron she had actually that morning washed and ironed, spread under her folded hands. Her withered old face was deathly as ashes, her cap borders scarcely seeming more blanched in color. Looking at her for a moment, as she stared straight before her into the dim shop, among the confusion of boxes and bags, it seemed to Lumsden as if her little share of sense had been stricken out by the shock, to leave her but one remove from an idiot. It was not so with poor Con. He had wept until his eyes were like boiled gooseberries, and there was a look of terror in them as they seemed to wander against his will to that awful closed door. He was sitting in the yard, on a box, when Lumsden appeared, and he welcomed the young man, though he was a policeman. Tell me all about it, Lumsden said, as he leaned against the fence by the boy. It was you who found him this morning, wasn't it? Oh, yes, sir. I haven't got over it yet. I'll never get over it. 
Oh, you will. Never fear of that. When did you see Jones last? I mean, alive. I didn't see him after I went to bed about nine, sir. But I heard him, off and on, for a long time. Someone had taken the key out of his bedroom door. He blamed the police for it, I think. At all events, he couldn't find it, and went on awful. I fell asleep after a while, and when I wakened up, I heard him saying, Good night, Turner, and someone came out the back door. Where do you sleep, Con? In that little skillion room at the end of the veranda. Mrs. Jones sleeps in the other one. Only hers opens into the kitchen and my room doesn't. Lumsden considered a moment. If Con had heard Turner so plainly, how was it he had not heard Jerry Swipes so shortly after? And there was that light he had twice seen in the kitchen. Who had carried that? You heard nothing after that, Con? Nothing, sir. I fell asleep again and never wakened till morning when Mrs. Jones called me. Oh, she called you, did she? She always calls me. Mrs. Jones is up by daylight, but the master wouldn't let her call him. I had to do it about seven. I always knocked, and he was easily wakened, but this morning I knocked and knocked and got no answer. And then I remembered about the key being lost, and I opened the door quietly and called again. I could see the bed then and guessed something was wrong. And I went a little nearer and and Con covered his face with a shudder. What did the old woman do when you told her? She only looked stupid and stared at me, and then when she appeared to understand, she said yes, that she would put on her apron and mind the shop, and there she's sat ever since. Con, there was someone moving about the place with a light at two o'clock this morning. I saw it in the kitchen window myself, do you think it could have been Jones? More likely Mrs. Jones, sir. She's often wandering about the kitchen at night, and she seemed very unsettled when I went to bed last night. Having got all the information he could out of the lad, Lumsden went in to see the terrible object in the guarded and darkened room, and then to visit the poor old woman, who sat in state, minding the shop, while her murdered husband lay within a few yards of her. If the young policeman had any hopes of getting information out of her respecting the light he had seen in the kitchen, he lost them ere he had been speaking to her five minutes. This is a sad business for you, Mrs. Jones, said the young man in a low, sympathetic tone. Have you no neighbor that would come and sit with you? He would never let me have no neighbors, she answered woodenly, as if a machine were speaking. I'm minding the shop. Why doesn't Con come in? I want Con. I'll make him come in presently. Mrs. Jones, was it you that had a light in the kitchen at two o'clock this morning? The sudden way she turned her fishy eyes on him set the young man wondering, and her unexpected reply startled him. There was no lights, only dead lights, and the dead hearse was there. I heard him say it. It was all quite true. Watch him, and you'll find out. Lumsden remembered that she had used those very words when he was in the shop yesterday. But he did not know that it was Jerry who had originally said them, and that they had made a terrible impression on the poor, ill-treated old creature. Do you think that you'll keep on the shop now that the old man is gone? the young constable asked, out of curiosity as to her reply, and finding nothing better to say. Yes, I'll always mind the shop now, always, me and Con, with a clean cap and a white apron, and no one'll beat me and knock me about. The old woman's eyes now glowed with an almost fierce pleasure. She drew up her head and wagged it at Lumsden in an alarming manner as she spoke. He drew back, scarcely knowing whether to be shocked at her apparent insensibility or not, when Cooney appeared behind him in the doorway. I wish we could find that key, Lumsden, he said, not observing the old woman, 
It's very awkward not to be able to lock the body in. I've got no key, almost shrieked Mrs. Jones, as she stood up and faced the speaker. Why don't you take him away? Tell the dead hearse to come and take him away quick. And she almost fell into the old chair again, trembling and shaking all over. She's not even half-witted, Lumsden said. What on earth will become of her? Do you think the old man was any way well in? I don't know, replied Cooney, who was closely observing the old creature, who sat shaking in her chair. All at once she got up, and muttering some indistinct words, tottered away into the kitchen, and from it to her own room, and they heard her locking the door behind her. Have you heard anything fresh? inquired Lumsden of Cooney, who was staring after Mrs. Jones in an odd way. I've been talking to the doctor. He says that when he called here this morning, Jones had been dead five or six hours. Do you remember what you said last night about that groan you heard, Lumsden? You said it was real at any rate, and so it was. It was about that time, or a little before, that he got his death stab. And you know the weapon has not been found, Lumsden. Whoever had that light you saw last night knows something of the murder. You have changed your mind about its being Jerry, then? I don't know. He might have come back again, went for the knife, perhaps. But several of his neighbors are ready to say that the blood on his clothes was on it yesterday. He sells rabbits, sometimes, it appears. And another thing. The doctor says the weapon must have been an unusual one, long and narrow and sharp at the sides. Such a wound as is in his breast could not be made by even an ordinary carving knife. I am going to make a very thorough search of the premises. Con? Yes, sir. The two constables had been passing through the kitchen while Cooney was speaking, and when Con was called, they were standing under the veranda between the two scullion rooms. Con? questioned Cooney. The old man has been killed with a long, narrow kind of knife, the doctor says. Do you know of anything about the house answering that description? A long, narrow knife? repeated the boy thoughtfully. The master used to have an old thing like that. I think he used it in the cellar. I saw him sharpening it on the grindstone yesterday morning. It was rusty and had a black handle. You haven't seen it since? No, sir. What are you driving at, Cooney? Is it very likely the murderer would find and leave his weapon here on the premises? I'm going to have a hunt for it at any rate. Lumsden went out of the yard and across to Turner's, for he had a mind for a talk with the woodman about his visit to Jones's last night. He found Turner very busy sawing in his yard, but with such a serious face that it was evident the murder of his neighbor had agitated him greatly. Yes, he said, as he sat down on a wood heap and wiped his face with the loose sleeve of his shirt. I'm awfully cut up about it, though Jones was not a man any of his neighbors cared for. But you see, I must have been the last man that talked to him before he was killed. It was you I saw last night, then. Oh, yes, it was me. And it's a good job the boy heard the old man bidding me good night, or I might have been suspected myself. I went over to get paid for a little job I'd been doing for him. Clearing out the still, maybe? Lumsden asked suspiciously. Nonsense. Not that I'll deny the old man did once work a private still in his cellar, for he owned as much to me last night. And I want to tell you something else. They say that you saw that phantom hearse last night? Yes, I saw it, was the short answer. Well, Jones told me a queer story about that last night. He said that he would never again have anything to do with illicit distilling. He was getting too old, and that the dead hearse he had encouraged such talk about all these years was nothing but the conveyance that used to come for the whiskey now and again. Some man was in the secret with him, it seemed, and they had a black cover and so on, made for the cart so as to frighten people. I'll take my oath, cried Lumsden angrily, as Turner concluded. 
that what I saw last night was no real conveyance. I went as close to it as I am to you, and I put out my hand twice to try and touch it. But I had only air in my grip. And how could a natural thing disappear from under my very eyes when there wasn't a thing from end to end of the street but moonlight like day? Turner smiled as he remembered that this defender of the supernatural had only yesterday scoffed the very idea of a ghostly appearance. But he only said, "'Tis impossible to account for these things. But there's an old saying that mocking is catching. It may have been the real thing last night, as a sort of warning for people not to imitate the dead. Have you found any kind of clue to the murderer? Swipes is arrested, you know. Oh, he never did it. No more than I did. He's low and drunken and foul-tongued as Jerry, but he wouldn't spill blood. Who do you think did it, then? Ah, Constable. If I had any suspicions, I'd keep him to myself. It's rather a dangerous thing to accuse an innocent person. But I'll go so far as to say that I think both the lost key of the old man's door and the knife that killed him never left his own home. And Turner turned to his work again. Turner's opinion that the lost key and murderous weapon were in the corner house renewed the young policeman's interest in it and he returned to see the result of Cooney's careful search. "'I haven't left a corner, hardly,' said Cooney, in reply to his question. "'And Khan has been helping me. We found nothing bearing on the murder. Khan, go and try if you can get the old lady out of her room. Say she's wanted in the shop. That'll fetch her, I think. Cooney, are you going to search her room?' "'Yes.' "'You have some suspicions?' I can't answer you now. Follow me and you will see. I must get into that room by hook or by crook. Won't she come out, Con? She won't answer at all, replied the boy, who was knocking at the door in the kitchen. Cooney went round to the small window of the skillion room. There was a coarse curtain over it, but perceiving that it was simply hung on hinges and opened outwards, the experienced constable soon drew it open and was master of the situation. Lifting the curtain aside, he saw Mrs. Jones sitting on a box opposite to him, quite immobile. It appeared as if extraordinary emotion of some sort had frozen into helplessness every bit of brain power of which the poor old creature was possessed. Mrs. Jones, there's half a dozen customers in the shop. Don't you hear Con calling you? Open the door and let him in. She got up mechanically, still keeping her eyes fixed on Cooney, who was leaning in the open window. But she seemed glued to the spot where she stood, and kept her hands behind her in such a strange way that the policeman decided on active measures, and he had bounded through the open window and was standing before the now trembling old creature in a moment. Cooney's first act was to open the door, and then having Lumsden and Conn as witnesses, he put a hand on Mrs. Jones' arm and drew her forward. The instant she was touched, her hands dropped to her sides, and there was a sound of something falling. Lying on the floor behind her were the key of her dead husband's door and the long, rusty weapon the unfortunate man had sharpened for his own murder. I thought it was something this way, said Cooney as he stooped for the articles. God help her. She's not accountable. How did you come to kill the old man, missus? It was quite true, she said stonily. Watch him, and you'll see. I must go and mind the shop. Past the horrified con, she staggered, and her shaking hands groped before her as one in the dark. Opposite the door leading into the shop, she paused unsteadily, looking towards that of the death chamber which was on her right hand. Then she turned to the right, opened the door of the darkened room, and glided in. All this time the men and boy were watching and following her. When the poor old creature crossed the threshold, 
she put out her hands in an attitude of entreaty, as though to the dead, and falling on her knees by the bedside, her face sank to the reddened coverlid over which her outstretched hands lay. She spoke no word, not even a moan passed her lips. And when Cooney had waited vainly for a moment or two, thinking to hear some word of prayer or entreaty, he stepped forward quickly and raised her face. She was dead. So best, he murmured. She's gone to keep shop in comfort in the big city. I'll never believe she knew what she was doing. It seems to me a matter of impossibility that an arm like that could strike such a blow, muttered Lumsden. She struck through no bones, and the way the man was lying made it an easy job. I've been hearing something from Khan that made all plain to me. It seems that Jerry Swipes told her to watch the old man yesterday. The fool was only amusing himself, trying to excite the poor old creature's jealousy. But a fool's words often make the devil's opening. It was she that took the key of the door, so that Jones could not lock himself in, and the devil laid that long knife handy to her. May God have mercy on her soul. And maybe that's more than was said for the man she murdered, Lumsden discontentedly remarked. Maybe he doesn't want it so bad. At all events, he had no blood on his hands. No more need be said, save that never, from that day to this, has the phantom hearse been seen near Jones's Corner. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of The Phantom Hearse by Mary Fortune. If you have enjoyed this book, please visit our website at classictalesaudiobooks.com and sign up to be a financial supporter. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook. You'll be glad you did. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week, and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>